thank you for joining. We have 50 participants right now. And um, I'm very delighted to present the first session of the MicroHE final conference. Um, so what we will de do today is quite an ambitious program for the next one and a half hours. I will give you a short introduction to the micro credentials topic in addition to the keynote speech that you just heard from Anthony. Then uh, Manuel Dolora will explain uh, the curiosity-driven education approach of the Code University. And then we will go into workshops. We will have four workshops uh, and for 50 participants, we can try. Uh, we discussed this, whether we would do uh, random distribution of into workshops or uh, selection. Selection is not so easy in Zoom. So uh, workshop one is the changing role of university teachers for learning and assessment. Workshop two is the value of digital credentials for assessment and recognition in higher education. Workshop three is expectations in the future of micro-credentials. And workshop four is what do students and employers really want. After those workshops, we will uh, have a short results sharing uh, session and then uh, it's the end of the session. So what I'd like to ask you now is to choose your workshop that you are interested uh, to participate in. And the instruction is that um, you go to the participant list, you activate the participant list at the bottom of your uh, Zoom uh, window or screen, you go to the participant list, you ho hover over your name, and then you have a menu that says more, rename, and then you, you put the number of the workshop that you want to participate in, in front of your name. So I will be in workshop four. Please put a four in front of your name. And then Alistair will assign you to the workshops. So we have another 20 minutes until the workshop starts. So I hope you can uh, do it. So please uh, start now. I will introduce the speakers for today. Uh, so I'm coordinating the MicroHE project. I'm a researcher at DHBW Heilbronn, which is a university that integrates academic studies and workplace tra training within the curriculum. Um, Raymond Trudak is a colleague of me. Uh, then we will, um, uh, we have Manuel Dolda, who is an economist and edupreneur. He's co-founder and president of CODE, a university of applied sciences in Berlin with study programs related to digital product development and an innovative learning concept based on curiosity and entrepreneurship. Elena Trepole is an associate professor at Jotas Magnus University in Lithuania. Matteo Ugeri is an instructional designer and researcher at Fondazione Politecnico di Milano in Italy. And Laura Palacina is a graphic designer and learning e-learning de e developer also at uh, Fondazione Politecnico di Milano. So, um, I see some names are being, uh, some numbers are being added. So the MicroHE conference track has two more sessions uh, at two o'clock uh, Central European time on technology powering the future of micro-credentials and um, at four o'clock on the impacts of micro-credentials on institutional processes. I'll give you a short overview of the MicroHE project. So um, the MicroHE project is, is investigating the potential of micro-credentials to transform the European higher education landscape from the perspective of policy, technology, pedagogy, and institutional strategy. We are eight partners from all across Europe. And the components you heard already in the keynote speech. So a learning credential is a documented statement made about a person's learning by another person or institution. A micro-credential is a subunit of a credential. 
A short learning program leading to a micro-credential typically has a workload of between 25 and 30, 300 hours or 1 uh, and 10 ECTS. Most higher education institutions are only beginning to adapt to the trend of unbundling of education and uh, micro-credentials. Institutions are lacking practic practical already existing examples of short learning programs and micro-credentials. Uh, Institutional chain of command is often missing for uh, short learning programs. Rules are unclear. A business model is missing. And um, flexibility, personalization, and recognition are critical when using short learning programs to respond to the demands of the labor market. What we did, we uh, developed a microHE metadata standard, but you don't even need to bother because it's already retired. Um, it's been consumed in the new Europass learning model in the European digital credentials infrastructure. So they have taken up what we have developed. We developed the macro credentials standard on the basis of ESCO. ESCO is the multilingual classification of European skills, competences, qualifications, and occupations. And after we developed this metadata standard, we realized that technology actually is the easy part, getting institutional processes for issuing and recognizing micro-credentials right, and using harmonized vocabularies is even more challenging than uh, creating a data standard. And uh, one strength of uh, microHE that is in uh, contact both with uh, DG Education, Youth and Sports and Culture, from which we receive our funding, and with DG Employment, uh, Social Affairs and Inclusion, which is responsible for ESCO and Europass. So we are in, at the intersection of different um, parts of the European Commission with our work. There are high expectations uh, relating to micro-credentials. So uh, those are statements from a Delphi study that we did. Uh, micro-credentials will decrease skills mismatch and enhance employability and co contribute to better career planning. They will enhance student motivation. They, the underlying metadata on skills and competences uh, will enable learners to express learning outcomes beyond mere participation certificates. Micro-credentials contribute to the well-being of society, are helping students to prepare for jobs that do not exist yet, and uh, they help anticip anticipating future needs. So the participants of our Delphi study very much uh, emphasized uh, the, uh, uh, the goal of uh, the social development goal for ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. We realized that developing a micro-credential strategy, both for offering online or blended short learning programs to students and the wider public, and for recognizing micro-credentials, will be key to a successful implementation of the European University's idea. And in fact, one of uh, the members of our consortium is now exactly implementing uh, the micro-credentials uh, strategy in their European Universities Consortium, ECIU. You'll hear about it in the uh, session at four o'clock. That was the short project overview. Now to our specific question in this workshop. The dilemma is students love flexible learning pathways and new, the new possibilities that MOOCs and micro-credentials bring about. They will take unbundling for granted. Students expect their university to recognize micro-credentials and to open up their sometimes rigid curricula. But HEIs uh, are um, reluctant to change. So how can uh, higher education institutions strike a balance between flex flexibility and rigidness and guarantee that an awarded degree meets high academic and professional standards? So students expect uh, from micro-credentials more focused content, more practical learning experiences, 
more updated information, more personalized learning, more open access to knowledge, more flexibility in planning their studies. But open learning recognition is quite tricky. So um, on the left side, you see uh, the traditional um, um, Erasmus uh, exchange setting, and on the right side, with virtual student mobility and uh, learning opportunities that do not always come from quality assured uh, higher education institutions, but from other outlets as well, uh, you see that it's much more, much trickier. We have a lack of trust and transparency. Uh, and um, so the idea is to give the right information to the right people so that they can prepare. So, Students want to display, accumulate, accumulate transfer uh, credentials uh, using a learning passport or some similar tool. Higher education institutions need sufficient information about a credential to make an informed and consistent decision on recognizing open learning as ECTS credits towards a degree program. And open education providers need to know which information they should provide and which formal requirements exist regarding workload, learning outcomes, assessment, ID verification, EQ F level, and other things. And why are we doing this? Because um, the future labor market will demand the T-shaped the professional. So the, um, the um, the students will, or the graduates will need the, uh, uh, um, um, in depth um, qualification in their field. So they have a bachelor or ma uh, in chemistry and a master's maybe, but they will also need the ability to act successfully across disciplines, contexts, and systems. So, um, one example is. Um, um, Industry 4.0, uh, automated production. So we don't need only an engineer who is uh, a, an excellent uh, uh, electric engineer, but they also need to know, have a systemic thinking, need to have understanding of other uh, fields. And so our vision is that um, micro-credentials are generating value for the learner for the, the graduate as well as for the employer. So we will still have uh, at the core the university program and degree, the Bachelor of Engineering, but that this will be supplemented with a pre-internship, maybe uh, interest-driven uh, uh, micro-credential on artificial, artificial intelligence, Part of the bachelor is actually of often an internship with or without uh, ECTS. So there might be some more internships and then the student might want to choose uh, specific uh, short learning programs for uh, the, the skills development that they are interested in. And then they will do a master's uh, program maybe. And all this is to prepare them for jobs in the future that do not even exist today. And all this is, is happening at the, uh, we call this the strategic triangle. So higher education institutions are on one side, the world of work, and on top are the students or employees. And um, these three uh, aspects have to be considered. And now I, to conclude on my presentation, I have a quote by Maria Stici Damiani, and she is in the workshop uh, as well. Hello, Maria. We had a, uh, in October a micro credentials, digital credentials masterclass uh, on invitation only, and uh, I have a quote from her. She says, we should consider adding a new section on micro-credentials to the European standards and guidelines, just like a new section was added in Paris for joint degrees. Why not think about half a page on micro-credentials on the basis of the European standards? We need to add a supplement to the micro-credential. 
which would indicate the learning outcomes, the level, the number of credits, the quality assurance, and the teaching and learning approaches. Then we would be fully aligned with the European higher education area. This common standard would facilitate micro credential adoption. So, so far from, from me, um, I would like to give instructions to those who have joined late. So, uh, let me see, can I... If I go back to this slide, um, we have four workshops and um, please indicate which workshop you want to participate in by going on the participant list you activate it on the bottom of your screen um, and then put the number of the workshop that you want to participate in in front of new, your name by renaming. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. And then I would like to hand over to um, Manuel Doldova, who is um, founder of Code University. Um, and he will tell us about their um, novel approach to university education. Manuel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jochen. And uh, thanks again for inviting me and giving me a chance to collaborate here. Um, it's, uh, it's really interesting because uh, you were the reason for me to think about micro-credentials um, again and uh, more extensively. I mean, I've, I've tried to follow these discussions, but um, because you invited me, um, I realized how much this whole discussion and the development has to do with with code and what code is and what we're trying to be um, so before I, I dig deeper into that um, let me quickly tell you a little bit about code in general very quickly we are a private university of applied sciences in germany founded in 2017 so we are very young still uh, we now have uh, 350 students from 65 different countries. So we are a very, um, very diverse community. Uh, about, um, apart from German students, there's no really no other uh, prominent country. So they're really from all over the world. Uh, we are going to take in our fourth generation of students this year, probably then growing to a community of roughly 500, a little bit above 500 students. And they're enrolled in three study programs, which is software engineering, interaction design, and product management, all three undergraduate programs. In addition to that, we offer, not only offer, but we kind of force our students to attend courses in what we call our science, technology, and society program, which is our way of confronting students with uh, the difficult relationship between technology and society and the impact technology has on society. Um, we want them to, to think critically, to make critical judgments and to learn to have an informed opinion about the world to be able to, uh, to, yeah, to act on this. And um, maybe let me take a step back and, and talk about why we're doing this, which brings me then to, uh, to the topic of, of micro-credentials and how we have interpreted this, uh, this approach um, and incorporated it into our learning concept. When we started founding code, we thought it would be a good idea to actually um, ask people what they would expect of a graduate from a modern university these days. And we talked to HR people, we talked to founders, we talked to managers, we talked to entrepreneurs, and we always expected them to be quite specific in, in, in what they would be looking for in a code graduate. But the answer we got most of the time was, well, we can tell you what we're looking for today, but if you are asking about the future, like 10 or even 15 years into the future, we have no idea. Uh, to be honest, we don't even know if our company or business model will still exist, let alone what technologies will be important to us, what methods we'll use. So um, we can't help you. And we kept digging, and in the end, what we, what we ended up with was uh, a bunch of not very surprising 
key human traits and capabilities, competencies that um, many of you will recognize as part of the discussion about 21st century skills, like the ability to creatively solve problems, the ability to collaborate and communicate in teams because you're not solving these problems, the meaningful ones on your own. And in teams means in interdisciplinary and interdisciplinary and international teams. Um, the ability to, to um, have something like not just critical thinking, because most of the time thinking is not enough. You have to have the ability to come to a judgment and then act on it, which also requires an entrepreneurial mindset. And behind all that is the, the drive to keep on learning throughout your entire life, basic, um, hopefully driven by your own curiosity. That's why, as Jochen mentioned, uh, what we are trying to, uh, to offer to our students is a curiosity-driven educational concept. And this um, is where it's, where it's getting interesting for our discussion, because we said one thing that was really clear to us when we tried to implement our learning concept and carve out the details was that it wouldn't matter where students learned or how students learned the things they, they learned, but just that they could demonstrate that they had a certain competency. And competency for us means it's not enough to just know things, you have to know things and you have to be able to apply them. Apply them in a meaningful way. So that actually means for code, we had to solve the problem of how to recognize things that people had learned before they even came to code, no matter where they learned them. So um, of course, there's a, there's, there's a system in higher education in Europe where you can uh, recognize credits that people uh, have acquired at other universities. But the more challenging part, especially if you talk about subjects like software engineering, is all those people who are basically self-taught, who learned most of the things they have, the competencies they have on their own or on the job or in other um, informal settings. So, so we said this is a key element of code that we don't force students to, to be present in a classroom, but give them a chance to recognize the things they've learned wherever and however they've learned them. Um, and that had a huge impact on the way we do assessments. So basically, we don't have any written tests. We don't have any multiple choice tests. Uh, an assessment at code is always basically a conversation between a professor, like an expert, and a student where the student needs to demonstrate the knowledge and the competency they've acquired and how they applied them in a project or in a practical context. That was for students who came to code, but it also means that at code students can choose how they learn while they're studying. So for example, it's not unusual for code students to plan ahead to go on an internship for a couple of months. And before that, sit down with a professor and talk about what they will be working on in this internship, what, they, what technologies, what methods, what topics they will be concerned with. And um, basically um, kind of, um, coming to an agreement with a professor on how to demonstrate the things they've learned so they can use their internship to acquire new competencies and then just need a certain setup for the, to, to demonstrate to the professor that they've acquired this certain competence. And that's how we can formally acknowledge these competences and give the students the credits they've earned for it. So in a way, what we did with this um, chance to recognize formally and informally acquired competencies and allowing students the freedom to choose what their learning strategy and the setup would be they prefer, we've kind of created a sort of micro-credential ecosystem within code. That also includes the fact that students can choose, um, choose modules, topics, competencies they want to acquire from all three study programs. So we're not forcing them to take a certain path. We, we are encouraging them to basically build up their own, their individual competency profile using competencies from all three study programs. Because again, one of the results of these interviews we did in the beginning was there is no single perfect profile for any of these professions. It's Oftentimes that um, the people who have a profile that is in between professions that can build bridges among professions are the most, most interesting ones. So we wanted to encourage students to really look at themselves, look at their own curiosity and find out what they wanted to learn and then create a system where they would get a lot of support from professors to actually learn the things they want to learn and also figure out 
how to how how to learn them in a way that is suited to their personality, to their circumstances, and to everything um, that is related to to them as learners. So, in a way, we try to build a, you know an, an educational institution that is not centered around the teachers, as most institutions are, but centered around the learners, the students. And the professors, the teachers um, would more would, would not see them as as first and foremost as actually being teaching to students, but um, more supporting them on their individual learning journey, which also means um, counseling them on which modules, which competencies to add to their existing profile. Uh, maybe um, making them aware of uh, gaps that they have in the profile. All these things uh, would be um, the responsibility of a professor at Code who would sit down with a Code student on a regular basis to actually have these kinds of discussions. That doesn't mean uh, that, we're, uh, that we're not teaching, but it's usually demand-driven. So our professors teach whenever they see that students need this kind of input. What we're also doing is we are trying to inc include all the learning resources that are already out there. And um, by the way, because the question came up in the chat, um, we're doing everything in English. That means we have a vast amount of learning resources that we can use, that we can integrate into our learning concept where we don't need our professors to, to give, uh, give a presentation, the 150th presentation on some introductory topic because it's already out there and probably in a better quality than we can have. So it's more like also giving students the ability to find meaningful and good learning resources and integrate them into their learning. So in a way, as I said, we've created something like, uh, like a micro-credential ecosystem. Students can choose um, learning goals from all three study programs. That includes the SDS program, which is um, science, as I said, the science, technology, and society program. It's not a study program of its own. Um, it is mandatory for students in all three study programs. And it is basically to try to, um, to help students acquire very basic competencies of learning how to write, um, scientifically, how to think um, scientifically, how to develop an um, entrepreneurial mindset and a critical judgment ability so they can actually make sense of the world, connect the dots, and then have a, a meaningful opinion, an informed opinion on topics, on critical topics, and especially in our case, on topics related to the relationship of technology and, and society in general. And in this SDS program, again, it is the student who is in the driver's seat who has to decide how they want to demonstrate certain competencies, how they want to acquire these competencies, and also how they want to demonstrate them, whether they want to write an essay, whether they want to give or teach to other students, whether they want to um, organize a conference, whether they want to learn a specific uh, task and then demonstrate that. That is... Um, all up to the student and this also requires the student to think a lot about themselves and what they want to do what they want to learn and how they want to shape their individual profile that also means that we've been struggling with a lot of things um, because we oftentimes we are confronted with students who come to us and they have already studied at other universities. They've successfully passed um, modules and courses. They have some ECTS they bring along. And we're sometimes struggling because um, on a formal level, we would be required to just accept these credits. Um, and we do, if the student insists, we, we definitely do, um, do that. But on the other hand, we often see that the competencies, the proficiency levels that students have acquired um, doesn't really meet our standards because for most educational institutions that, that we've seen so far, it is enough to know things and to just reproduce the knowledge in a written or in an oral way. What we want to see is students being able to 
actually apply the knowledge in a meaningful way. And that's most of the time the missing part, or it's the other way around that students know how to do things, but they're missing this reflective perspective on their own doing because they're self-taught. So they're muddling through, they're making things work, but they're not really aware of how these things work. So we're in constant discussions with our students, hopefully in a way that, that helps them learn and realize what's still missing on why we, on the, on the one hand, would probably be forced to recognize credits they bring from other universities, but we would still encourage them to, um, to, to go through another learning journey and see if they can maybe reach a, a higher proficiency level that we would encourage them to do, or that it is not enough for students to just be able to solve problems using technology as long as you're not able to reflect on, the, on, on, on how you do things, the methodologies you're using, because that, again, would be a requirement for continuous learning. So um, this is where we are right now. We've been trying to adapt based on our students' feedback, on our own experience, the learning formats we are working with. And, and one key format that we've discovered is uh, what we call a guild meeting. That is basically students coming together and talking about a certain subject. So at the beginning of every semester, students choose a topic they want to work on basically as their project and they form teams around this project, um, interdisciplinary teams from all three study programs. And then they start working on a solution or trying to understand the problem they're, they're working on. And while doing that, they will discover a lot of things that they don't know or they're not able to do or maybe where they're not able to link the, the theoretical knowledge they have to the practical challenge they're facing. And that's where they come together in these guild meetings to discuss these problems and challenges they're facing and that they're, not really, uh, that they're struggling with, uh, with implementing solutions or that they have something that works, but they don't really know why. And this is, again, where the professor is more like a moderator than, than a teacher to make sure students actually get some helpful feedback, either from other students or from the professor to move on in their learning journey. And with these projects, we, we see a similar challenge as with the recognition of prior learning is that sometimes students are really happy with the success of their projects and still fail an assessment because, uh, again, we see that they're not really, that they haven't reflected enough on the competencies they've acquired or they haven't acquired and that they created an amazing outcome that there's actually something, a prototype that's working, an MVP, something that's gone live, even people who already have some customers with what they build or earning money. Um, but still the understanding of the methods and technologies they've used is, is not enough for, for what we're looking for. And, and I see a lot of, um, a lot of these topics related to, to challenges um, in this micro-credential, the general micro-credential ecosystem that, that Jochen talked about and uh, that, that I think we will, would all like to see. Um, so one thing is that how do I know which, um, which competency or proficiency level actually is behind some kind of credential? Is there a way for me to easily find out whether this is actually the standard I'm looking for? Um, is one of the challenges that we see all the time, either for students, as I said, that bring these credentials from somewhere else, or for students that acquire them within our own learning uh, concept or learning system. And Behind that is one of a, a very fundamental question that I would love to, to hear everybody's thoughts on. And that is, what is, if, if we think about this credential thing as a kind of a universal um, currency for, um, for things you've learned, for learning outcomes, what is it that we're actually trying to measure? And so again, this is something that we're struggling with at Code um, basically every day to really be very clear and precise to ourselves and to our students in what is how, how is, how does successful learning actually look like and how do you measure that once you've accepted that it's not just about the reproduction of knowledge, you just somehow scrammed in your head and now are able to reproduce. Um, so for us, as I said, it's usually that we, that we still ask students to go to a quick demonstration of competencies they've acquired um, even though, of course, we would accept um, any things we need, we formally are required to accept, 
But most of the time, once students are in this situation where they need to explain the competency they've acquired and demonstrate how they would apply their theoretical knowledge to solve meaningful problems in practice, they realize that there's still something missing. That means for us that assessments take up a lot of our time, a lot of time and our energy from our professors. That's, that's why I chose also this topic for, for the workshop um, um, that, I, that I will be, will be hosting after my talk. And it is still something that I'm, that I'm struggling with um, to, if we think about code in the future. Because um, the more students we have, the more energy our professors spend on assessing and the less time they actually have to consult students to support them, to, to teach them and to work with them on an ongoing basis. Um, maybe uh, as a quick look into the future, um, I don't, uh, one thing that, that we've discovered for ourselves is that uh, what we're doing is not really scalable. So code is definitely not a model where we could say, let's ramp this up to 10,000 students because being in this community, having this close relationship to individual professors who are able to understand where you are on your learning journey, where you learn things, being able to observe students on their learning journey is a very, is a key element. So, so this is one thing. And the other thing that we've not really been able to implement so far, but would love to have more is peer to peer assessments. What we already have is peer learning. Um, a lot of students support each other because they're experts in some aspect and they teach other students or they learn from other students who are already, already ahead of them. But I'm, I'm still wondering, is there a way to integrate uh, forms of peer assessment to this idea of um, having some kind of micro-credential ecosystem? So it's not only the professor who can formally acknowledge competencies that people have acquired, but um, other people can, can give each other these kinds of, kinds of credentials in a meaningful way. Um, of course, while avoiding any kind of, of fraud or uh, deterioration of, of proficiency level expectations. Um, that's just one thing that, that we are, um, we're struggling with or that we're working on that we, we're trying to, to find answers to. And I'd, I'd love to hear everyone's perspective on especially the role of professors in this kind of, of ecosystem where maybe as a summary, it shouldn't matter where students learn things. It shouldn't matter how they learned them. It shouldn't matter in which environment they've learned them, as long as they're able to demonstrate the knowledge and the competency they've acquired um, in the setup that, that we can provide. Um, yeah, I hope this gives you an in insight into, into code and the learning system we're trying to build and also build some, some bridges to the discussions about micro-credentials in general and, and what they mean for, for us as a very young University of Applied Sciences who are trying to incorporate this curiosity-driven learning concept um, and recognizing and focusing, really focusing on learning outcomes and not on the time um, students spend when they're, learn when they're learning stuff. And I'm happy to maybe um, answer some, some quick questions that, that may have come up um, before we uh, head over to the to the workshops. Yes, thank you, Manuel. Um, we have one raised hand, Mohamed El Fati. Um, could you please speak up, unmute your microphone, and pose your question? Mohamed. Okay, so we'll wait a few more moments. In the meantime, time I will um, remind you of the schedule. So we are perfectly on time, 12.10. You now uh, go into the workshops, workshops one to four. Um, for those who haven't done so, please activate the, wait, uh, uh, please put a name, rename yourself and put a uh, number of the workshop that you want to participate in, in front of your name. Um, is Mohammed now ready to ask the question? Mm, I don't see it. 
So then I suggest we go into the uh, workshops and uh, we have 25 minutes for the workshops before we go back into the plenary and have a short results sharing session. Alistair, are we ready to go into the workshops? Um, at the moment, there are still about uh, 12 people who have not uh, put down a workshop number in front of their name. And uh, in just a few seconds, I'm going to put you randomly into a group. So last call, otherwise you will be in a group at random. In fact, I'm doing that now. Okay. Any other questions to Manuel while we're waiting? So the teaching language question was answered. So there was a um, comment from Ursula Goetz, looks like the crit critical thinking subject in English colleges. So that was referring to the science, technology and society uh, part of the curriculum, right? Yeah, that's, that's exactly where we got some inspiration for this. Um, there's actually study programs that are called science, technology, and society. Uh, we sometimes also call it, call it like digital humanities. Uh, still trying to figure out what exactly it is, but we definitely had some inspiration from these. Yeah. Okay, we're ready for group work. Okay. And uh, what's going to happen here, I'll just put my video on so you know who's talking. What's going to happen here is I'm going to press uh, you to go to your group rooms. You will go there. You have to accept the group room invitation. You'll get a little pop-up and they'll say, do you want to go to group room number one or two or three or four? You just say yes and go there. And we'll call you back uh, in 25 minutes. So here we go. Just click and accept the offer. Yeah. Wait a minute. And also the live streaming. Okay, so we, we in our uh, workshop at least had a not so surprisingly, uh, there were not so many voices, voice contributions, but we had the contributions on the Google Sheet that we created. Um, Let's see from the other groups uh, what results they have. First, um, uh, someone from uh, the first workshop, uh, the role, the changing role of university teachers for learning and assessment uh, of Manuel Dolor, who would like to share. Um. Oh, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, can mm -hmm. I can I share my screen? Would you yes. allow me to share my screen? That would be great. Um, host, host disabled SD screen sharing. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, you should have. I thought you were um, already enabled for that. Uh, uh, you should. You are. Go. Ah, no, now you're going to be co-host. Yep. Uh, I'd forgotten to make you co-host. Off you go. Thank you. So we created a mirror board um, to collect ideas um, and, and talk about them. Uh, so let's say we mostly managed to raise questions and uh, didn't find a lot of answers, but that's just because most of these questions are very profound and have been discussed, discussed for quite a while. So um, the questions that I, that I started with is, what's the most important role of a professor in this micro-credential world? Um, it's definitely a changing role, um, but the question is, what was it? And I also started with mentioning that for us at Code, one of the challenges, how do we make sure that the professors don't spend most of the time assessing students because um, they come with new, newly acquired competencies from everywhere and basically just want, um, want, the, um, want the official approval, so, so to speak. Um, so one of the issues that was raised was how do we create, uh, how do we make it easier for professors to accept this new model, to accept it, to build trust, to maybe help them with a the shift of mindset that's necessary to not just say, you know what, uh, I haven't taught you, so how should I know what, you, what you're capable of doing? How should I, ex why should I accept something you've learned somewhere else? Um, 
one of the participants mentioned that this might be a specifically German problem, which I can agree, but it's probably also a problem for, for other universities or other countries as well. Um, one thing that might help is that professors get an insight into how students actually arrived. So maybe one thing that could be helpful is that if micro-credentials not just show uh, basically the title of a competency acquired, but maybe also give insights into how the students arrived at that, what the learning journey looked like. Another participant mentioned that it might be helpful to have projects, project outcomes, um, actual things you can look at where students applied the knowledge or the, the, the competency they've, they've been credited with the micro-credential. Um, then of course the question, what about micro-credentials for teachers? Is it also something that can, um, that can demonstrate what, what teachers have, what area of expertise they have, but also what, what pedagogical qualities they have and, and competence that they've acquired? Is it something that only is important for students, but, or could we use this also for teachers? Um, and then there were some specific questions, of course, the general question of interoperability, how do we connect practices in this in, in, in a university landscape so people actually accept these things and they connect to each other. Um, and then some, some um, remarks towards that it's easier to, to hand out credentials to actually be aware of the, the competency students have in smaller groups and how do we manage big groups, how do we maybe even integrate peer assessment, so it's not just the professor, but also other students. Is there a way to implement such a system? Um, yeah, these were the, the topics that, that, that we discussed in the workshop. Um, please, if, uh, if I missed some of the, the topics um, for all the other participants in workshop one, please unmute yourself and maybe share your thoughts that I missed. Well, it seems I covered everything. Thanks. Okay, so Elena, um, on your workshop, uh, the value of digital credentials for assessment and recognition in higher education. Uh, could I be the last one? I'm just finalizing the slide. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Laura and Matteo on expectations on the future of micro credentials. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, it was a very, very interesting uh, conversation and uh, I can also uh, again share uh, some of the findings with all of you. Uh, in a sec. Um, okay, we use a Padlet. Uh, I hope everybody of you is seeing now. Um, so uh, our workshop was about um, expectation of the main stakeholders of, uh, of the project and uh, related to, to the micro-credentials. And uh, so um, we got back to our work done with the interviews with students, higher education institutions in terms of teachers, researchers, dean, rectors, and so on, employers, and regulators. So um, we asked the participants that, that uh, have been very active uh, uh, to uh, say what do they think in their experience uh, that students expect from micro-credentials and same for the other three categories. And um, I, I, some of the findings are quite in line with, uh, with the findings of uh, the, the, the work we did um, with the interviews uh, months ago, uh, especially, uh, for instance, flexibility for students and um, uh, the, the, the fact that learning has to be quality-driven and uh, so the micro-credential can provide a proof of the value of such uh, high-quality learning. So that's, that's something very important for them. And um, again, the relationship between the, the, the university and the labor market is, is very important uh, uh, when dealing with micro-credential for students because for them, they are a way to respond better to the needs of the labor market and preparing them for the jobs of tomorrow. So this is again also with uh, having updated learning that can be uh, um, very quickly uh, credentified in, in, in this small bits. And uh, again, ability to focus on competence development, and this is something that uh, goes also with um, employers. Uh, so uh, soft skills, soft skills development, and reskilling of, uh, of um, um, employers, for instance, is something that is extremely important for companies and for students. 
And also for regulators, uh, if we uh, talk about, for instance, unemployment, so govern governments are uh, obviously worried about the level of unemployment in Europe or in the world war nowadays. So uh, micro-credential are seen as a way of maybe not solving issues, but uh, supporting to solve issues in the labor market in terms of skills mismatch, upskilling, risk skilling, and so on. And uh, funnily enough, uh, the participants to our sessions were quite shy and, and saying about expectation uh, in the higher education institution, although most of the participants here are from such institutions. But uh, after having been a bit pushy with them, they say that uh, maybe they want some ability to control and control, as you can see here with the emoticon, is something that a word that we don't like very much in, in the academia. Uh, but it's true that, that this might be helpful, especially when dealing with uh, uh, interinstitutional recognition uh, uh, and uh, to uh, speed up the process of uh, um, accepting students, for instance, from other institutions, from other countries. And uh, it's not written here, but we, in, in the chat, someone else say that um, uh, this helps also in um, reducing the bureaucratization of uh, uh, anything that is related to mobility of students. And that this was another finding we had in, in, in our research uh, through the interviews. And, um, I, I don't know if there's something more to be add here. Uh, so I can switch to the other findings that are uh, related to the future of micro-credentials uh, in terms of adoption. Uh, for those that uh, may have uh, uh, read the, the report we wrote for micro, he, we asked to the interviewers how do they think micro-credential adoption will look like in 2000. And 20 or uh, so next year because we did it in 2019 uh, or uh, but now uh, we, we ask it to the participant to the workshop uh, when do they think uh, micro credential will be fully adopted and uh, at least in European level so most of people as you can see here from this red heart uh, say that 2030 is the reasonable uh, year for that so in 10 years and uh, so it was quite funny because when uh, um, when we asked to uh, to our stakeholders in the in the interviews of uh, micro he um, about about that uh, somebody said uh, with a very negative attitude that nothing is going to change. It was 2019, <laughs> and <laughs> I, I don't know who was this guy or girl, but something has changed. And I'm sure that micro-credentials uh, and uh, the lockdown have some strong relationship as well that might be worth exploring um, because uh, the future of education is changing very fast nowadays. But that's all from my workshop and I wish to thank very much all the participants and my colleague Laura Barracina that helped me in preparing it and in, in, the, in managing it. Okay, thank you Matteo. So let me now share our results. <clears throat> um, so um, we said for the student ex students' expectations that st the student is in the driver's uh, seat. They want to make their skills uh, visible and validated through micro credentials. But there was a voice that said they want to have valuable credentials. And nowadays, they, the most valuable credentials they get is still a university degree. They want to have additional uh, qualifications. Um, Online uh, or robust assess assessment and ID verification is an issue, um, but the technical systems are there uh, and, and it's uh, all solvable. Um, will students want to take micro credentials uh, and then be able to stack them into a formal qualification? This is a question we said that. A free for all will not be the solution, but uh, rather they will. Uh, there will still be requirements uh, to get a certain uh, degree. So employers want to have 
uh, employees that are T-shaped, that are have uh, deep uh, uh, knowledge of their field, but also universal knowledge, uh, future skills, and education institutions need to prepare students to uh, be providers of services in the future, not employees. Um, flexibility is key, so people will have to change jobs several times in their life and need a portfolio of different knowledge and skills. Uh, and then, uh, as part of the European Digital Credentials infrastructure, infrastructure, there will be a register of trusted education providers, um, accredited education providers in some way, and they will have to uh, prove that they have uh, trusted assessment methods. Um, this is all from our group, and then I invite. Elena to share from her group the results. Yes, just a second. You should be seeing my slide. We were discussing uh, the micro credentials and the form mm, sorry, of. Sorry, I cannot see your, slide. your slides. We cannot see them. Okay. I have. Uh, here. Can you now? Can you see them now? They're coming up just a second. All right. There's okay. a bandwidth problem, I think, so that it's coming very, very slowly. All right. Do you see them now? Nope. Now, here we are. Yes. Off you go. All right. Excellent. So um, we were discussing the uh, acceptance uh, of digital badges at the universities, how they're used. I presented uh, my university case. Um, uh, we researched the database uh, model uh, to see how many digital badges were issued by our teachers for the students. and. Um, uh, their metadata descriptions and found out that they have very poor descriptions, uh, having very um, limited information. And um, after that research, we worked out uh, uh, a standardized metadata template for digital badges uh, to be issued at the university by any teacher. And I asked the experiences of other um, higher education establishments across Europe and uh, we found out that um, in Poland, in Latvia, in uh, um, also Japan, uh, 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 digital badges are not exactly trusted and used within the university setting but um, they are considered and being used um, in outside university but university related uh, professional development courses and so on so uh, and they are um, uh, valued by the employers and by the learners themselves and um, uh, we also uh, thought that digital badges could be um, more accepted by the universities if their metadata would be um, uh, richer or more confirming to the um, high education quality requirements. And uh, in that case, digital badges could more contribute to the assessment and recognition systems um, uh, within higher education. So, um, yes, this is our short um, uh, group uh, uh, feedback. Uh, stop sharing. Yes. Maybe somebody from our group would like to add something. All right. Jochen? Yes. So thank you very much. Um, so our time is up. And I'd like to um, uh, give you just the information on the um, 
to consider to following micro he micro credentials sessions can you see my screen yes you should um, and um, then i hand over to alistair for uh, closing the session thank you and thank you all for participating it's over overwhelming and um, a really good uh, it's really rewarding to have, have you all in this session and in the conference.